result in the attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi two nights ago. Christopher Stevens was an Arabic speaker. He was a longtime student of Libya. He had lived in the country on and off for a long time. He understood the country well. And in 2008, he wrote what in retrospect now seems to be a really important and really chilling memo about this particular place in Libya. See, we'll show you. This is where Libya is on the map of North Africa, right? You can see Libya sort of juts into the Mediterranean at two different points, on the west side and on the east side. On the western side there, you see, is Tripoli. That is the capital of Libya. But it is way over on the other peninsula, on the right, on the eastern part of the country, where the city of Benghazi is located. And this place that Christopher Stevens, our ambassador who was just killed, the place he wrote about in 2008 in this cable that was un uncovered by WikiLeaks, it's right there next to Benghazi. It's the city of Derna. And in order to understand how it is that we just had an ambassador murdered, it is worth knowing what that ambassador had to say about this place. It's really interesting and it seems to be connected. Okay, if Derna is famous in America for anything, it is for a bad reason. Uh, when the Iraq war was at its worst, when jihadist foreign fighters were flooding into Iraq from all over the world to go murder themselves trying to kill American troops in Iraq, Al-Qaeda documents that were seized by the U.S. Army in Iraq showed that the little town of Derna in Libya sent more volunteers to die in Iraq in 2006 and 2007 than any other place in the entire Arab world. Libya, per capita, as a country, sent more fighters to Iraq than any other country. But it was specifically Derna, that town, that sent the highest number of fighters. The most. Full stop. And in 2008, the man who would become our ambassador, Christopher Stevens, he went to Derna to assess the state of militancy and anti-Americanism there. And his cable back to Washington actually used the Bruce Willis movie, Die Hard, as an analogy for understanding how intense the local attitudes were there about jihad. Once the uprising against Muammar Gaddafi was underway, CNN reported this June that Al-Qaeda Central, the part that used to be headed by bin Laden, Al-Qaeda Central, dispatched a top operator from the tribal areas in Pakistan to go to Derna, to go to that part of Libya, to capitalize on that town's legendary militancy and also what by then was the raging fight against Gaddafi's forces in Libya specifically. The assignment was to set Derna up just outside of Benghazi as essentially a new mini Afghanistan, a new hub for Al-Qaeda with multiple training camps there for Al-Qaeda fighters. That was last year. And ultimately this murder of an American ambassador did not happen in Tripoli, didn't happen way over on the western part of the country, in the capital, where the U.S. has its embassy, and which is guarded by U.S. Marines and has full security. It didn't happen there. It happened when the ambassador was in this lately fortified consulate building over in the eastern part of the country, in a city that's basically right next to what al-Qaeda is trying to build as a new hub for terrorist training. The city of Benghazi, right near Derna, is a city that in the past few months have seen, has seen multiple attacks that are not just about local grievances or lingering anti-Qaddafi stuff. They're about targeting the West. On May 22nd, there was an attack on the Red Cross in Benghazi. A group claimed credit for it, and in so doing, they filmed the entire attack. And then in their video, they interspersed footage of the attack with other traditional Al-Qaeda-type references that you see in other Al-Qaeda videos. In this case, they interspersed pictures of the attack with a speech about martyrdom that took place underneath the black flag of Islamist militancy that you can see here. And this was not a run-of-the-mill, we're mad about local issues attack. They were not attacking a target of strategic local significance for Libya. They picked a Western target. They picked a Western international target, the Red Cross. The name of this group claiming credit for that attack on the Red Cross, they said their name is the Brigade for the Release of the Imprisoned Sheik, Omar Abdel Rahman. Well, okay, the imprisoned Sheik, Omar Abdel Rahman, is currently imprisoned in North Carolina. In Butner, North Carolina, it's the blind sheep guy who was imprisoned in connection with the first World Trade Center bombing back in 1993. So this gang of militants in Benghazi is not saying that they're mad about Gaddafi. They're not, not mad about corruption or some local issue. They are named after a guy who's in prison in America for plotting attacks in New York City. And to express their anger about it, they attacked the Red Cross. The following month, the United States announced that US a U.S. drone strike had killed a Libyan who was the second-ranking guy in Al-Qaeda Central, a guy who went by the moniker Al-Libby, which means the Libyan. 
The same group in Benghazi responded immediately. Within 24 hours, they launched another attack that they filmed Al-Qaeda style, and they ultimately cr claimed credit for it. This time their target was the U.S. consulate in Benghazi, the same U.S. consulate where Christopher Stevens was killed two nights ago. They hit the consulate with an IED. They turned the attack into an Al-Qaeda style video piece of propaganda. Less than a week later, the same group hit a British envoy in Benghazi with a car bomb. That envoy ultimately escaped, but again, it had all the hallmarks of either Al-Qaeda inspiration or Al-Qaeda training. They filmed the incident, they dropped leaflets, they tried to take as much credit as possible. And then on the morning of September 11th, this week, Al-Qaeda Central put out a video calling for attacks to avenge that same killing of Al-Libi that the group in Benghazi had avenged before, when it was first announced that he was killed. And by that night, by the night of September 11th this week, we had what appears to be an organized, military-style, sustained, sophisticated, complex attack on that same U.S. consulate again. And this time they killed the American ambassador and three other Americans. As we learn more about that attack, the idea that this was just a protest gone wrong, that it was just a, a grassroots angry mob that overran this facility, that seems less and less likely. It was a sustained attack that took place over more than four hours. We are now told that it involved two different locations, the original consulate building and another supposedly safe site to which consulate per personnel uh, were removed. The weapons of the attackers included rocket-propelled grenades, which even in a well-armed populace isn't the kind of thing that your average easily offended shopkeeper keeps around to be used in the event of blasphemy. Rocket propelled grenades? Today, Al Jazeera English reporter Hoda Abdel Amid went into that now burned out U.S. consulate building in Benghazi. And Al Jazeera essentially recreated what happened that night. The reporter spoke to witnesses who were there. We should note that not all of these details in this report have been independently confirmed by NBC News, but I think this is important. I want you to watch part of it. Watch. This is the gate from which the attackers entered the grounds of the consulate. Now, according to the witnesses here, they were in four cars with black flags and were heavily armed. Their first stop was that building. It's the canteen of the consulate. There are four one-story buildings in the compound. The gunmen made their way to one after the other. This is the main building of the consulate. Now it came under rocket attack and it was set ablaze with a terrible smell of smoke. Now according to witnesses, the ambassador was locked in that room behind that metal gate. And maybe in the chaos and with the heavy smoke, they couldn't find the key to get him out. The ambassador was trapped here, so some people came in, got him out from this window. Those protesting the anti-Islam movie had stayed outside of the compound during the shootout. Theirs was a peaceful demonstration. But looters joined in, ransacked everything, and took away whatever they could on their way out. Witnesses here say this could have only been a well-planned attack. Maybe an act of revenge for the killing of Al-Qaeda's number two, a Libyan national who died in a U.S. drone attack in Pakistan a few months ago. Witnesses say this could have only been a well-planned attack. The attackers arriving in four cars all at once, flying black flags, heavily armed. Also, NPR's Leila Fazel also spoke to a number of witnesses on the scene, people who were in the area that night. Here's what she reported a short time ago. She said, a lot of the witnesses we've spoken to, neighbors, the son of a landlord, a Libyan guard who was wounded in the first part of the attack on Tuesday night, all say there was no protest at all. They say it began and ended as an organized attack on the consulate. An organized attack. Anybody who tells you that what happened to our ambassador and our consulate in Libya was the result of a protest over an offensive movie, you should ask them why they think that. And that was the first version of events we heard. That does not seem to explain what happened that night. It does not seem to be borne out by the facts, the more facts we get. One of the known local militant groups, which is maybe just an umbrella group name for all the religious militants in the Benghazi and Derna area, uh, has issued a vaguely worded claim of at least participation, if not responsibility, for the attack on the consulate. But the Guardian newspaper is now reporting on a new video showing militants from that group driving off with vehicles that were stolen from the consulate compound. This is not about that movie, that stupid anti-Islam movie that is driving the protests at Cairo and around the world today. We're going to be talking more about that later. 
But what happened with the murder of four Americans, including our ambassador in Libya, does not seem to have been the product of an angry crowd of civilians. It appears to be militant, armed, internationally directed terrorism by an organized group. If it is not an Al-Qaeda attack, it is an Al-Qaeda-style attack, which is frankly what the threat we used to think of as Al-Qaeda has largely turned into. It's Boko Haram in Nigeria. They're attacking, they, they like attacking churches. Human Rights Watch says that Boko Haram have killed more than a thousand people in the past three years. It's Al-Shabaab in Somalia, cutting off people's hands and stoning people to death. It's Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula over in Yemen. The latest drone strike against a senior Al-Qaeda leader announced by the United States was reportedly the killing of their number two leader on Monday. It's Ansar Dean in Mali. The one, they're the ones who have been destroying the religious shrines in Timbuktu. Timbuktu is not just a metaphor for a faraway place. It's an actual real place on the UNESCO World Heritage Sites list. And they've got an actual real Al-Qaeda-style Islamic militant problem. It's also Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, in Mali and in Algeria and in neighboring countries. They and Ansar al-Din have essentially taken control of northern Mali right now. Now, some of these groups have Al-Qaeda in their names. Some of them do not. But what matters to the United States right now is not just names. And what matters to the United States right now, not just in terms of our interest and in how things broadly go in other parts of the world, but in terms of our own national security as Americans, is how much these groups and others like them are interested in and moving toward international terrorism. How much they are interested not just in the local concerns that make them a plague to their host governments and the civilians who are in their way, but how much their ideology turns their interest and their targeting toward us, toward Western targets. I do not mean to be harsh about this, but what we are looking for as a nation in terms of the narrowest conception of our national security is where is the overlap between militant, trained, armed, organized fighting groups and anti-American ideology? Because that overlap is the U.S. consulate attack in Benghazi and this brigade for the release of the imprisoned Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman and the murder of our American ambassador, the first murder of an American ambassador in the line of duty in a generation. What you're seeing in all the protests at U.S. embassies in the Muslim world is anti-Americanism, but it is not the same thing that happened in Libya. It is a different kind of threat that comes from a different place and requires a different response. NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel joins us live from Cairo, Egypt. That's next. The Capital One Cash Rewards Card gives you a 50% annual bonus, and everyone likes 50% more approval. 50% <laughs> more simoleons. 50% more Starbucks! 50% more clams! It's a lobster, either way. The Capital One Cash Rewards Card. With a 50% annual cash bonus, it's the card for people who like more cash. 50% more dough! What's in your wallet? This is Rudy. His mornings start with arthritis pain and two pills. Afternoon's overhaul starts with more pain, more pills. Triple checking hydraulics, the evening brings more pain, so back to more pills. Almost done when, hang on, Stan's doctor recommended a leave. It can keep pain away all day with fewer pills than Tylenol. This is Rudy, who switched to a leave and two pills for a day free of pain. And try a leave for what can you experience in a seat? Inspiration. Great power. Iconic design. Exhilarating performance. And once in a great while, 